Next session is on labour markets and the economy. Um, I'll invite Professor Oslo Monorang up and also Professor Gary Dimsky to come and join me. Um, this session, we're looking at macroeconomic challenges, employment and labour market conditions, wages and profits, and industrial organising. Professor Oslam Anurang, she's from the University of Greenwich. She's Professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich. She's the Director and the Co-Director of the Institute of Political Economy, Governance, Finance and Accountability. She's carried out extensive research on issues of inequality, wage-led growth, employment, globalisation, gender and crises, and has directed multiple research projects on those issues. She's also a member of the Policy Advisory Group of the Women's Budget Group. Oslam worked with us throughout our administration as well in developing our economic strategy overall. Oslam, thanks a lot. Wonderful good morning. Uh, I see that people are taking a comfort break, but hopefully they will join us back again. We decided to switch places with Gary, uh, who was before me in the program. Um, yes, thanks, thanks for having me today. So I'll talk a little bit about what's going on now in terms of workers' bargaining power, income distribution, wages, and why we should worry about it beyond the uh, inequality aspects about it, why we should worry about it from the perspective of macroeconomic destabilizing effects of uh, the loss of bargaining power of, uh, and, and income inequalities. And I'm going to then try to end what can we do uh, about it in the short run, well, the answer will be join a union. I came with my union branch today from uh, Greenwich here. Uh, but also uh, in the medium run, um, a bit uh, chiming with what Mary has described in the 2719 manifestos. I'll uh, put some numbers on what I call a purple, green, red transition program uh, can achieve. So let's start with now the bad news. That's workers' share in national income, white share. This had peaked at around 70% in 1975. It fell tremendously over the years of neoliberalism. Brief recovery, but where we were before the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crash in 2007, uh, was a labor share of 65%. That's a lot of redistribution from labor to capital. Things got worse uh, during the pandemic and is now getting worse, of course, with the uh, back to austerity uh, post-pandemic cost of living crisis. So we are uh, around 63% with labor share now. This is forecast to drop uh, further. Uh, we are talking about, compared to peak, a 7% loss in labor's income share. This is indeed looking actually even worse than what this graph uh, shows because the, the, the income share of the top 1% is also increasing. So if I had had numbers for the bottom 90-99% of the uh, workers, th their share would have deteriorated even further. And if we look at a snapshot of the time since the Great Recession, since 2007, now I'm not showing you the white share, but a component of it that is your real earnings, uh, real average weekly earnings, uh, corrected for uh, increase in prices uh, in, in inflation. It's looking at regular pay without bonuses only. Um, and 1995, that is 2015, that's not um, a, what I'm trying to talk about now, was uh, where this data was indexed to 100. But if you think about where we were before the crash, and if you see here where we are uh, basically at the beginning of the pandemic, we were not even back to where we were uh, before the great financial crash. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of diversity behind it. Public sector workers have been a lot worse off 
uh, well, then some other workers in the financial uh, sector, for example. There was some recovery, seeming recovery here. This is also partly because the lowest earners are dropping out of the pool of workers during the pandemic. Uh, but there we are now, uh, and as of where we are today, with the deepening of the cost of living crisis, rise in inflation without any matching pay rises, we are way below uh, about four percentage point lower than where we were before the Great Recession. So, so much uh, loss uh, and uh, loss that lasted now more than a decade. Uh, why is that happening? That's, I think, one of the most striking uh, data that I have seen in my entire life working as a uh, applied uh, empirical macro and labor economist. That's about our bargaining power. I say we, I mean trade unionists here, to be uh, specific about it. The blue line is union density, how many workers are a member of a trade union. That had peaked at 50%, uh, basically, uh, at the beginning of 80s. Uh, half of workers were in a union, but today that is uh, lower than uh, one in four workers uh, now in a union. It's actually more coming towards 23%, one out of five workers. It did improve a little bit uh, in the days of the pandemic. It differs across sectors in the public sector, particularly in the education. It was a lifesaver uh, to be uh, protected by a trade union. I'm really grateful about that to my own Union branch at uh, UCU. They saved our lives, they protected our working conditions, but that really didn't edge enough to really uh, bring us back to a powerful uh, union density at all. And if you look at another indicator, collective bargaining coverage, that has peaked in Britain in the late 70s at 85%. Almost all workers were covered by a collective uh, bargaining agreement fought by, by these union members. Well, today, the fall in this is even more dramatic. That's also down to about 25% uh, today. Until we reverse that, we are not going to sort out the co uh, cost of living crisis uh, in the short run, join a union. Well, unemployment rate, another measure of your bargaining power, my bargaining power, appears to be low, by historical standards, very low. Uh, we are talking about uh, unemployment rate being less than 4% in Britain today. Well, this is not quite right or reflecting the actual facts about people's bargaining power. One thing, unemployment rates started to increase now in the latest three months. This is particularly happening among men. Uh, and this is happening despite the fact that historically unforeseen number of people are now out of the uh, labor force, so-called economic inactivity. Because of health conditions following uh, COVID, this isn't just long COVID, you can't get a hip operation uh, because of the long queues uh, in the NHS, because of years of underinvestment in our uh, public services. So you can't work, you are economically inactive. Then there, uh, people need to be cared for, women are doing that. Historically, highest numbers of women because of care responsibilities are out of uh, the labor force. And obviously, there are some people uh, at the later stages of their life, they're uh, trying to say no to the unacceptable working conditions that we have been uh, facing, so-called the great resignation. Be that as it may, unemployment started to increase despite the fact that some of us aren't even looking for jobs anymore. How do we uh, reverse all of this in the short run? Well, this is what we are doing. I thought this is another uh, big uh, data point that I have seen in my entire life. This is the days lost due to strike, working days uh, lost due to strike action in the private sector. And this is what has happened uh, at the end of 2022. Compare it with the 90s, 2000s, that's a big change. This is just the private sector. Data ends at the end of the year. Uh, 
we will see how that is looking when we get more data, of course, from this year, particularly with the public sector uh, strikes that have peaked now, including ourselves, uh, teachers, healthcare workers. Now, I want to put that in historical uh, context. That's the strike days from the 1930s, well, to the end of the uh, 2020 previous year. Obviously, we were nowhere close to the end of the 70s, but come 2023, new data, I'm hoping to show that very soon, uh, this will start looking different. This is how you reverse. This isn't written in stone. It doesn't have to look like that, what is happening to our wages and labor share. This isn't because of technological change. And I crunch the numbers with my colleagues at Greenwich. Yes, I can prove it isn't. It is about the loss of our bargaining power. It's about this collective bargaining and union density. And within that context, obviously, the impact of globalization, the impact of technological change are being used by capital in ways to cause this loss in labor share. Now, uh, we worry about that. We fight against it. Uh, but there is also a macro concern, and that's not me, Financial Times, though citing our research that we had done for the International Labour Office United Nations, summarizing the fact that capital has been gobbling labour share for now four decades, but victory is empty. So why is victory empty? Well, the mainstream economists would tell you Wages are just a cost. If you dump them, moderate them, they will have a positive stimulus effect on private investment. It will stimulate exports. It will all trickle down. List trusts trickle down economics for you. Uh, part of it, least or trickle down story. But actually, this is theoretically wrong. Uh, because wages are not just a cost item, they have a dual macroeconomic effect. They are one of the most important source of domestic demand. Because we are the 99%, the rich uh, top 1% can gobble all they can, but that's not going to be the stimulus behind macroeconomic aggregate demand. The capitalists also need someone to be able to buy the goods they are potentially so profitably could produce. So when you lower the white share of the working people, three things happen. That for sure, one thing is for sure, it's going to lower domestic consumption of the uh, households. Because while the poor, the working class, consume more out of their income compared to their income uh, in comparison to the rich, profit-earning, high-income households. The second effect, the hoped-for trickle-down story, it could stimulate private investment. But hold on, private investment is not just about profitability. They're not that stupid. They're producing to be able to sell. They will look at market prospects. And when domestic households' consumption demand is falling because of the cut in wages, investment will stagnate uh, or it could fall. And that's what is happening. So investment isn't just about profits, it's also about, about demand. The third hoped for effect is the boost in exports, um, a decline maybe in imports, the higher foreign demand. Uh, True, if you uh, dump labor costs, that would be a stimulus to net exports. The question is, how big is that effect? You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't even have to be an economist or an empirical economist to uh, see that there is a negative effect on consumption of the households. There is a maybe positive partial effect on investment and some positive effect on exports. If you sum them up, what's going to happen? Theoretically, ambiguous. In empirical uh, analysis, what we find for countries like Britain, and I have done these estimations for more than 30 countries. Other colleagues have done such estimations for another 20. I could tell you, ask me a country, I could tell you what happens for that country. It depends, it's different. In Britain, however, I can bet 
uh, debt, the total effect is negative. If you dump working class households wage share national income, that will create a negative effect on the macroeconomy. Uh, we, well, post Keynesians, we here, Marxist inspired post Keynesians, Kalecki inspired post Keynesians, call it a wage led demand regime. So Britain is a wage led economy. If you dump the wage share, if capital gobbles labor share, their victory will be empty. That's what the Financial Times understood very well from what we wrote. Here is what can we do in the short run, uh, sorry, in the medium run. Well, in the, by medium run, I mean the four years of a progressive Labour government. And it's very much chiming with uh, the manifesto Mary has uh, uh, summarized 2017-2019 manifesto. I'm taking three elements of that and trying to put some numbers on that. Let's change workers' bargaining power, the terms of negotiation at the workplace, bid policies, changing uh, the Industrial uh, Act legislation, uh, trade union legislation, equal pay legislation, ban zero hours contracts and dodgy self-employment practices. A lot of details can go under that. With these policies, if we manage to achieve an increase in hourly real wage rate of workers, all workers, at the same time closing gender pay gaps, so you can see the red and purple color code of these policies, such that we achieve an upward convergence in the wage rates of men and women. Um, you do that by increasing also the minimum wage. Combine this with fiscal policies, in particular that will target the other crises we are having. We have a care crisis in an aging population, so you need to invest in what feminists call social purple uh, infrastructure. That is hiring more social care workers, more uh, nursery teachers, nurses, doctors, uh, teachers, and paying them higher wage rates, while at the same time trying to close also gender gaps. Invest in physical green infrastructure to address the climate crisis. That is investing in renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, that is insulating the houses, but also upgrading the grid, uh, and investing in technology that is going to increase energy efficiency in the industry as well and also invest in public transport with an aim to provide universal free basic services, very much in line with what Mary has said in her opening speech. Uh, and while doing that, increase the wages such that these are all decent public sector jobs. Um, these mean uh, that we are actually also expanding the size of the public sector substantially. My understanding by subsidies and by a little bit tricks to the private sector, you're not going to get the amount of green investment you need or purple investment you need in the right amount, right time, in the right place. You've got to do it yourself. That means you've got to put your money where your mouth is. I have had a discussion about that with the Korean presidency during the time of President Moon from 2017 onwards. Sadly, uh, they lost the next election, so now there is a very right-wing presidency in South Korea. They tried to do only the first thing, improve workers' bargaining power, increase the wage rates, with a little bit of social purple infrastructure investment. They were, however, surrounded by very conservative civil servants. And I was always asking Mary, um, around the conferences, John, uh, well, uh, the Shadow Chancellor used to organize uh, three years in a row uh, when we were hoping that we will get that manifesto implemented in power. Uh, how are you going to cope with civil service? Conservatively educated, fiscally conservative civil servants, they will try to uh, restrict your manifesto and its implementation. Dealing with that and the media around that, South Korea uh, failed around that, so they could never implement the second dimension, fiscal policy. If you don't put your mouth where your uh, money, where your mouth is, and just hope that by increasing minimum wages, the economy will flourish, 
just because an economist like me says your country is wage-led won't cut it. The real stimulus for addressing multiple crises but creating also enough jobs, decent jobs with decent working conditions, to provide the much needed services uh, that we need and uh, also to produce the much needed infrastructure we need, uh, the government has to do that. Private sector won't. Okay, and then we need to talk about funding that. Uh, obviously, well, uh, I, I crunch the numbers. If you spend one pound today in Britain, it will self-finance itself, half of itself, by uh, 50p's. Because when the government spends, there is more income. Even without changing tax rates, you will collect more revenues. But it's not magic money tree. Spend one pound, you get 50p back. You need to think what you do with the rest of it, how do you fund it? Obviously, Labour Manifesto was very creative, uh, talking about National Investment Bank as well, creating the network of uh, regional and a national investment bank, working together with Bank of England, uh, if need be, to create more funding for such investment. Uh, but we need more than that. We need to talk about progressive taxation of income and wealth. The past Labour manifestos talked about the more progressive taxation of income in great de detail. Now we are hopefully with some other Labour MPs, including John, but around the Socialist Campaign group of MPs, uh, finally talking about more details around taxation, progressive taxation of wealth particularly targeting the top 1%. Uh, we have crunched numbers around that. We can raise 70 billion with one scheme of taxing the top 1%. There are many alternatives. A democratic participatory uh, economic decision-making process can come up with. Um, I'm not going to go into details of that because you'll have a very long day uh, and I want to hear others as well. But what we crunch in this small simulation of a package tax uh, the top 1%, increase the tax rate on profit, decrease the tax rate on wages. Here I'm particularly talking about, obviously, uh, below the median uh, labor income. What do we get? Just, just a number summary. You get, in the medium run, accounting for productivity changes as well, in Britain, about 10% more national income. Mind you, fiscal policy effects are particularly strong. Uh, and fiscal policy doesn't mean, by fiscal policy, I mean investing in the social and green infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't just create income. It creates innovation and productivity. So the so-called productivity puzzle of the outlier Britain of uh, Danny, uh, well, can be sorted if you put your money where your mouth is, is the government. Um, and it's creating jobs for both men and women, um, particularly the social infrastructure. Purple investment is creating a lot of jobs for women in the given uh, gendered uh, occupational segregation. In total, we get about 10% more hours of work for women, 6% uh, hours of work, higher hours of work. For men. By the way, I'm not interested in creating more longer hours of work, but I am interested in uh, a convergence in how much men and women work for pay. So uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about shortening of the work week while we do all of that. But there are jobs that need to be done, there are needs for that, and we know how to fund them. Because all this package improves your public finance budget. So uh, a shadow chancellor waiting to be in power should think this is music to my ears, uh, if Rachel Reeves is hearing me. Um, public debt, I'm sure our former shadow chancellor will share that with her. Public debt uh, as a ratio to GDP in this package will fall by about 10 percentage point. But mind you, because we are texting wealth. Taxing wealth is one of the most powerful of everything I have countered. And very interestingly, it's not just creating money, it takes revenues. It is also stimulating private investment because tax concentrated in the top 1% hands is not turning to 
private investment. It is just financial speculation. Um, so if you tax them, you're creating a better business environment for small and medium enterprises in the bottom 99% of the wealth distribution. So that was actually quite exciting training for me. So in that purple, green, red New Deal, as I adopted for a caring, just, green transition, public investment is the key to summarize. It's partly self-financing, but you need progressive taxation of not just income, but also wealth. You need the National Investment Bank in the previous manifestos. I think we've got to get a bit more serious also about talking about monetary policy, what the Bank of England could, should do to accommodate uh, a government's fiscal investment program. Monetary policy will always be the small sister, not powerful, next to the bigger sister, powerful fiscal policy. It is to accommodate and serve what a democratically elected government wants to do on its mandate. Obviously, in the short run, until you do all of this and increase tax rights, uh, you need to start acting today from day zero when you're in power. Well, you've got to borrow as well. You've got to borrow on the basis of a new paradigm for fiscal policy, which we adopt as a needs-based fiscal policy. Not spending today urgently in green and purple infrastructure is irresponsible because it's risking our future. Uh, it is risking that we are entering irreversible uh, climate change danger zones. We are risking old people's lives. We are uh, risking working people's uh, lives. We need to spend today, uh, but it is investment. It is long-term productivity returns, so don't worry. And this is not just for uh, bricks and mortar, railroads type of physical infrastructure, it is also the case for what feminists call purple social infrastructure, which is dubbed as current spending in our national accounts, the wage of a social care worker, nursery teacher, teacher, nurse, doctor. This is not investment in your national accounts. And we are trying to give, as economists, the ammunition to policymakers, redefine this current spending is investment such that you can say in your fiscal credibility rule, it is okay to spend, to increase the wage of the nurse, of the social care worker, of the nursery teacher as well, because it's going to increase productivity. And we have proven that. We have research at Greenwich that does show that long-term productivity effect of this so-called social, uh, sorry, current spending. Uh, obviously, I understand it was a very, it is still a very conservative environment. Uh, our colleagues like John are operating with him. So here I am throwing myself such that there is some uh, data and empirical analysis they can hopefully use the next time they're in power. Obviously, if you s classify lots of current spending that is going to the social care economy as investment as well, in addition to all the public transport, social housing, renewable energy, energy efficiency investment. Um, I don't mind talking about then a fiscal credibility rule where a government says, I'm going to borrow if need be only to invest, but it is a very broad ticket item. Um, I'm using that as a sort of compromise to gain um, the discourse, if you like, to gain over the very cons fiscally conservative discourse. I didn't talk about shorter working hours. We don't have time for that. But obviously, uh, I'm not praising work. There is work that needs to be done. Let's do it. While, however, shortening the working week as well. Uh, and uh, what we have learned from the pandemic is it is actually possible. It is conducive to productivity as well. So I would like to see, of course, wage compensation, particularly below a threshold of income when working week is shortened. Um, uh, eventually, I would like to see uh, men and women 
doing more equal hours of work for paid work such that they also can do more equal hours of work for uh, unpaid care work in the domestic sphere while at the same time providing most of the care work through the uh, public provision of universal and free uh, care services. That doesn't mean that we're not going to care. We will care for our loved ones, uh, but we will do it under conditions we choose rather than uh, we have to. Okay, all that creates the ground for a productivity-oriented wage policy after we finally correct four decades of loss in labor income. If you invest, productivity increases, then you can increase wages, not just in line with the rise in prices, but also with uh, productivity. And for all that work, I'm not a centrist statist. Uh, this is going to increase the size of the public sector a lot, but it has to be embedded in a democratic participatory plan, um, including participatory decision-making procedures at all levels, including workers, users, uh, cooperative forms, and so on. I see the warning. Thank you. You are very right. I look forward to discussion. Thanks, uh, Oslam. Let me just introduce Gary quickly. Um, Gary grew up in the Northeast US, mostly Philly. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He, he was involved in community organizing anti-poverty work. Then was two, two years as staff director of Democratic Caucus in Indiana State Senate. He's now the professor of applied economics at the Leeds University Business School, University of Leeds. He's currently helping develop the Yorkshire and Humber Policy Engagement Research Network, which started out to assist with recovery post-COVID. And he's now feeding university insights into council efforts to achieve inclusive and sustainable growth across Yorkshire and the Humber. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Let me uh, just mention that, uh, let me find my, my slides first. I think we went a little bit too far back. Uh, but uh, Oslam and I agreed that uh, it made sense for her to go first. Uh, I've known her and admired her work for many years. And, uh, you know, clearly she was going to focus in on the key aspects of what's going on with labor in the macro economy. I'm going to fill in a bit of the other parts, and I'm going to try to hold the time as well. So what I'm going to start with is uh, basically, let's go back to Kolecki, who actually for a while lived in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know he was facing the problem of what to do about 20th century capitalism. And it, this slide kind of tries to highlight two aspects of that. Uh, at the, uh, the, the, the one idea uh, that uh, we can start with is this famous equation that he did that shows that basically if workers only consume and don't save, and if capitalists only don't consume and only uh, use their savings for investment, then basically, as uh, someone put it, capitalists earn what they spend. The idea there was that capitalist greed, uh, their, ish, their wish to have more profits, would lead them to invest, that is, in Marxian terms, to exploit labor, because that was the way to maximizing profits. Uh, now, that was 20th century capitalism. Um, and the other po point was made in this famous essay he did in uh, 1943, The Political Economy of Full Employment, in which uh, he, this is my picture of that, of uh, one of the points made in that essay. Uh, the idea was that you used to see capitalism as kind of fluctuating in its political economy between a point where uh, you notice that at the top line we have uh, high speed growth and low unemployment and then the bottom line here is uh, low growth and high unemployment and his idea was that if the thing goes too hot capitalists uh, the the workers will their wages will go up capitalists will do a capital strike they'll leave and uh, basically if it goes the other direction there's too much unemployment workers will resist now, what's happened is that both things have broken uh, both of these two parts that were maybe characteristic of the er earlier century have broken in our era. Uh, on the one hand, uh, when capitalists, uh, when there's too much growth, uh, basically the capitalists are, are not really leaving um, and denying us investment. They actually never do invest anymore. Uh, we don't have capitalists like that. And of course, the other part is that until recently, workers have not resisted. So we've had this distortion. And uh, basically, you know, where are these capitalists? What's going on? Well, 
Uh, what we're going to do here is just quickly go through uh, two, two parts uh, that's going to show the roots of the problem, this kind of taking a big step back and looking at the, the problem of the UK economy, where we are. And uh, yeah, you will notice my northern accent, although in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in the US, this is a north and south, as in the Civil War. So it kind of goes back. Um, points three and four, we're just going to point out some of the consequences of this. And then five, I've got some things to say about just some points for, for thought. OK, so it starts with the fact that we have long-term underinvestment. Those capitalists, right, they weren't investing so as, say, you know, taking their profits and reinvesting them in this country so they ex exploit our workers more. That's done. And I have three slides showing you that. Uh, basically, these, all of these three slides show you the rate at which investment expenditure, you know, uh, as it's called, um, as a share of GDP for the UK. And notice that here's a, something done by the, um, actually, ONS. And it shows an OS, an ONS report showing that uh, the UK is at the bottom of investment to, to GDP 2005 to 2017. You say, well, that's bad. Well, OK, here's the same report. They also show that we are below the we're below the 90, the 10% the level of the, all of the OECD nations, 1997 to 2017. Then I worked with uh, OECD num numbers uh, the other night, and basically what we have here is this is, uh, okay, gross fixed capital formation. That's a, one of the measures of investment as a share of GDP. Again, looking at the, a longer term period, and notice that um, the red, that's uh, the UK, we fall below all of these competitor nations or groupings uh, as of around 1991, and we never come back. There has been systematic stripping of investment capacity, of capital capacity for all these years. Now, also, a point's been made, and I'll just uh, show you one slide here from the ILO. Um, it's not a great slide, and I knew that Danny would be killing us with lots of stats. So what we have here is, uh, on that top graph, you've got the advanced G20 nations, and the little green one there on the very bottom is average real, real wage index compared to other nations. So that's just where we start, the first point. Second point of uh, what about, you know, what, what are the root causes? Well, so we have an underinvestment economy. This is the basis, for example, of the Bank of England recently saying, we can't get there. Why? Because they've killed off their own capacity. Um, now, the second thing is, this economy is running flat out. Okay, the, and you see these things, you know, the chancellor says, where it's said the highest rate of growth, and it, it was false figures and all that. But basically, take a look at just a couple of figures here. First of all, this is, uh, in, in I, here we've got the UK in um, red and the United States in blue. This is the activity rate. That means the percentage of people that are uh, 15 to 64 who are either in the labor force or are in full-time education. So this, you know, one of the measures. And basically what you need to see here is just that the U.S. has a much lower rate of activity than the U.K. People in the U.K. are involved and basically, and of course many of them are in poverty when they're working. Um, the second thing is just to say, you know, we often admire the U.S. economy for being such a great thing. Well, um, here we are at, um, you know, and you can just see that the unemployment rate is about parallel in the two. You know, that we say, well, the U.S. is doing great. Well, the U.K. on this metric is doing well, too, whatever that means. But what are the consequences of these periods of long-term disinvestment and so on? Well, the first one is that we've got this, we're stuck between what uh, Phil McCann has called the geography of discontent uh, and a dependence on foreign workers and our, basically, the invitation that we point fingers at each other and uh, seek to see our own characteristics, the consequences of this period of long-term underinvestment as sort of the things that we can blame, regional inequality and the productivity paradox. Let me just um, show you here that here's something that shows, for example, in this case, the UK is in red, 
in Yorkshire in the Humber where we've been doing some work is in blue. And this is just uh, take the ILO harmonized unemployment rates. And you basically see that unemployment is a bit worse in the, U in the Yorkshire and the Humber over these years. Basically, I would say, you know, look, people are working hard, but people are pointing fingers at the people who are working hard. Um, I've been part of a couple of productivity studies nationally, and uh, basically the, what they do is they just show the supply side. And the, the story that we hear about the North, the problems with the North, are that there's bad managers and incompetent workers. And uh, basically they don't look at the things that Olson was talking about, the demand side aspects. Um, and so everybody's hurting, but in the North, they hurt a little bit worse. Now this is the kind of thing, there's this thing now, the Productivity Institute uh, at the University of Manchester, and we had a, there was a meeting of this thing I'm on, this uh, regional productivity forum the, a couple days ago. And basically, this is the kind of thing that you look at in these, in these discussions. You look at the fact that, you know, here's Yorkshire and the Humber, and I mean, the details are not important, but a, a bunch of the cities there, and we're all below, you know, we're growing too slowly with productivity, and our levels are low. Even cities that like to think they're doing okay, like Leeds does now, and even when they, uh, they highlight, say, uh, Northeast and the Tyneside are doing really well, and you say, well, what's that about? Well, that's about your automobile industry. Aren't you in danger of losing that industry? Yes, you are. Um, so they basically, uh, the, there's this idea that, you know, we should capture foreign-owned manufacturing. Um, that's being blocked by Brexit now. And uh, basically, all the efforts that are being made at the regional level, they're not enough. They're not enough. We still have this problem of, of uh, lagging productivity, and there's never a, a willingness to point to the fact that we've been living in more than a decade of austerity, and that if you have an austerity economy, of course, the amount of registered output, which turns into right, is demand equals supply, is going to fall below level because that's how it works. Instead, they're just going to look at what's wrong with your people. They also, and here's, this is the, that same meeting, they show you things like this, that your productivity scorecard, it's a red, green, and yellow. So the idea is everybody is held accountable. We all have to do better. It's not about austerity, it's about these things about what can you do to make yourself better. And so that, that kind of is a mentality. Again, it's kind of changing, but the other thing now is that this thing that what can you do better who can you blame? So you get into a thing where, who can you blame? The North can blame the South. Devolved nations can blame England. Frustrated working class communities can blame immigrants. And their racial and ethnic and gender animosity and violence grow. Um, and actually here, what you see is that, you know, actually you need those foreign born workers. What this stat shows, again, this is made by, uh, I think, uh, ONS, is that uh, basically 18% of workers in this economy are foreign born, uh, including myself, I guess. Um, now, uh, actually, let me just say that there's a, those of you who know my work know that I talk a lot about, cap, uh, about uh, finance. And we, the reason we get caught on things like that, that uh, crazy episode recently with the mini budget is that we have a current account deficit. We're dependent on foreign capital. So what do we do about all of this? Okay. It takes a plan to beat a plan, Minsky would have said. And I've got a few points to make, and I'll try to be super disciplined because I'm a little bit running behind myself. Uh, first thing is, we got to confront the fact that we we've got this long-term decline, and we need a bold economic plan. Uh, we have to start with that decline, and we have to start with the fact that we don't have the capitalists that, that Kolesky faced. Uh, we, these are not people from Kolesky's day. These people are financial, this, this group, is financialized and risk averse. They're advised by specialists in hedging risk, uh, in arbitrage and carry trades. The, these, the capitalists that Kolesky is talking about are mostly leaving. The largest firms, even in the city of London, are foreign owned. And they hesitate right now to invest more in the UK in the wake of Brexit and uh, in the, the shape shifting UK government policies. Global financiers, of course, now see the UK as basically just a fertile ground for financial manipulation and gains taking. This mini budget, of course, is mentioned. You cannot count on London and SE productivity growth 
uh, to save the UK economy, right? Much of the, uh, much of the problems, uh, while much of productivity today derives from the City of London, its position is precarious post-Brexit uh, because of, in part, the absence of protocol agreements and protectionism is creeping in everywhere. So we need a developmental state approach um, and with guardrails to protect against capital flight, uh, as well as taxing the rich, as was mentioned. Um, and the, this notion, this regime of the UK as a tax, global tax haven for financial capitalists, first pointed out by Jerry Coakley and Lawrence Harris a long time ago, 40 years ago, we have to end it. We need productive finance to build a future UK, not short-term rentier position taking. So, regionally speaking, yeah, bottom-up energy and dynamism. There is a problem of skills mismatches and knowledge and motivation shortcomings. Uh, many of these hardworking immigrants need upskilling as well as do their children. So you've got to put in a sustained program of investment in people, schools and teachers, vocational education, retraining. Even the current government sees that the UK will collapse without public health care and adequate human and social services. So knowledge creation is a key um, and as well. We've got to take advantage of the fact that one thing I have seen in this country since coming over uh, from California is that there is an, an interconnected, vibrant university research teaching infrastructure. Uh, now precarious, right? But it, it, it can be linked more closely to colleges, schools, and communities. So basically, we, I think also to have this notion of saving the country by saving the people, make it a watchword for coming generations. It's going to take time to under, undo the damage of under, underinvestment and the workers that we need. So we need to free up the bottom-up energy in an over-centralized state, bring oxygen back in the system. And uh, my final point here, I'm, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides there at the end. Uh, basically, we need to commit to a negotiated, fair, long run. Uh, in this respect, the UK, which is now an afterthought in the global economy, can transform its role. Uh, we have to run economic growth, uh, first of all, in the, while we are here in Koletsky's middle zone. We can't afford to break capitalism. We have to modify it until we can talk about socialism. Um, and the workers need to know we're on their side. And we need to see the capitalists that actually are interested in investing can make a fair return and not fly away. This means, of course, turning to circular economy investments as well. Um, we have to think about what we can sustainably sell because we're going to have to import some goods and therefore have to export some goods. How do we do that? Uh, we have to really rethink this idea of fully funding expenditures, as we hear said on the news, uh, to adapt. Because, you know, you need a, if, you, if you need to talk about that, then talk about a payback period longer than a year or two. Um, and uh, basically, if, this, if, if we even have to keep this concept, the city of London itself can play a role if we modify that role. Uh, we can reimagine it as a global hub for the Herculean task of financing the global transition um, in a plan that they talked about in COP26 that's not done yet. So we need not rentiers but ambassador financiers. We're not so far away now that I'm going to leave it right there just to say uh, there's uh, three slides you can take a look at if you wish. One is this is the insights that were given to us by the mostly mainstream economists who run the, the, the Productivity Institute. This was three days ago. And if you look down this list, you will see that actually there's a little bit of hope there. There's room for dialogue, and we think we should continue to engage in dialogue with people on the mainstream for sure. And the final two slides, I won't read them, but I leave you with them. This is the very start of that famous 1943 article by Kolesky. And basically, he not only summarizes the idea of the expenditure multiplier, which Ozum highlighted, but he basically says, you know, this is how it can work. And the way it can work is if we can control capital, get it moving in the right direction, use it in together with public expenditure to make it happen. And I'll just read that last little bullet point that is mine, not Kolesky's. What was true in 1943 remains true today, despite those economists who have forgotten that Keynes and Kolesky once saved the capitalism that they are now destroying. Let's not destroy it. Let's preserve it, make it reasonable and rational so we can convert it into socialism. Thank you very much.
Gary Eslin, thanks ever so much. Um, you can see how one merged in, into the other as well. I'll take a couple of questions and then we're going straight into the next session. Rob? Mike? Mike? Is there a mic anywhere? Shout? shout, Rob, shout. I'll shout. I'm, a, I'm an ex teacher, so I've got a loud voice. Um, <laughs> very brief question. How do we change financial markets from being masters of our economy? Thank you. Joe, so I think one of remind people who you are. De thank you, John. So uh, I'm Joe from Debt Justice. Um, fantastic presentations. I think one of the effects of low wages and low public investment has been that working people have been encouraged to inflate their purchasing power through credit. Right. That's long been recognised as a problem. Um, so the level of credit now, outstanding credit in the UK economy, is about 207 billion. And there's lots of reasons to think that a lot of that is unpayable and will have to be written down. So we think that there's a role for governments to engage in targeted debt write-off. Does the panel agree? And if anyone wants to hear more about it, I can bore them over lunch. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Quickly. Yep, yep, yep. Quick. Thank you, Glyn Sacker. I would like to make some political, political observations on what we've just heard about poverty and about wages and organized working class. We have 12 million people in the country suffering dire poverty. That's the equivalent of London, Birmingham, Manchester and Bristol populations combined. It's horrific. And we have, on the one hand, an organized working class now really fighting for preservation of working conditions and wages against a vicious attack. But those battles are going to get settled at some point. That's why people go on strike to, for a settlement. That's going to leave the hungry and the people suffering dire cold in the political wilderness. And I am really worried that that's going to leave an open door for the far right. When you've got a large number of people who we had very emotionally and accurately described as suffering in a whole number of ways, despair, humiliation, combined with anger, that is really dangerous. And we have a rise of the far right across Europe. We have Le Pen getting 40% of the vote in France last time round. We have the, the rise across the whole of Europe. We've got Trump in America. We don't need to emphasize the horrors that are, 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 are at our door there. So what do we do? Well, we've got Right to Food, which is a brilliant organization started by uh, uh, Ian Byrne, uh, MP in Liverpool, putting pressure on local authorities to produce free school meals and so on. But that is an organization which makes the point that hunger is a political choice, and that's the political choice of our government. What I believe we need to do is to build now hunger marches so that people who are suffering begin to have a means of expression and take control of their lives, of their anger, to be part of the fight back. And that needs to be integrated with the labor movement and with the trade unions who also have members, there are nurses who come off night shifts and go on food, go to food banks. In fact, there's a food bank now inside King's Hospital. I was talking to the nutrition about it, nutritionist about it yesterday. We have to build those links, that intersectionality, and it has to happen quite quickly, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bring the panel back in. There's others have indicated we can bring in the next section because they are linked to exactly as that. Muslim, do you want to respond? Uh, with respect to how to tame finance, 
obviously there are many things around financial regulations, capital controls that we can talk about. That's all very important, well-trusted, tried measures elsewhere in the world, as well as in our own past. But I will say just simply grow your own, meaning we need to make sure that we have a large publicly owned uh, financial sector. By public, I'm using the word broadly. It includes, of course, uh, state-owned banks, regional and national investment bank network, but it also involves uh, municipally owned, locally owned savings uh, banks and cooperatives. If you grow all your own, you can then suffocate private finance. And if we are strong enough, yeah, go for it. I'm in favor of nationalizing the financial sector. There are, I have a list of, Christmas list of which sectors I want in public hands that includes the care economy. Uh, energy, uh, transport, finance is in my list. I am now including uh, food, uh, agriculture and production in the form of cooperatives as, as well because we can't leave that to agribusinesses and speculation in commodity markets. But yeah, grow your own and suffocate, take control. That's how we will do that. Um, that uh, restructuring I totally agree on um, the cri This crisis is just starting to unfold in very ugly ways that will include, of course, uh, divide and rule and racism in it as well of, the, of, of frustration. But the debt of households and the uh, debt of the bottom 10% of the firms is in a very serious position. If you are serious in power, you need to deal with this. I had proposed linking debt payments of the households to income, banning evictions uh, with respect to both rent, but also uh, with respect to uh, utility bills or uh, tax. Um, but obviously these are all short-term emergency measures that we've got to do. And then what do we do that's the medium run? But we can't let uh, these people evicted uh, and build on it a strong and stable economy, if you remember the reference. I mean, it's not humane, but it's also not macroeconomically stabilized. It is destabilizing. Debt is destabilizing. This debt has been accumulating year after year, along with the 40 years in the graph as the chair is falling. I mean, you got me right there. It was in my slides, and I was being uh, told that I should wrap up, but you're absolutely right uh, with that. Um, and, I mean, obviously... Um, I agree with everything you have said about, uh, you know, solidarity networks, uh, food solidarity in particular. But um, whatever we we can think about, enough enough is enough. There are very good campaigns that we should go and build and relate with. Is the union movement? Uh, is I mean, something I can say. Thanks, Thank you, Gary. Yeah, uh, on the uh, financial. Um, Oslam said it nicely, but I would say uh, keep in mind uh, the UK, as Coakley and Harris pointed out in 19, I think, 83, has been a tax haven economy, and recent books have talked about that too. Um, so, you you know, basically, you got to regulate your markets, you got to end tax havens, uh, we need some capital controls, and part, key to part of all of that is to get money out of politics. These banks that actually are... Uh, going to be replaced, Ozum hopes, by public and quasi-public institutions, they're no longer lending. That's not what they do. They're sustaining a super-leveraged, uh, globalized financial system that basically entraps them as ways of making their 1%. So it's not functional. It's a dead weight around the hand, uh, the, the, the neck of the advanced capitalist nations. Um, leave that there. The far right and so on, absolutely, uh, that's why, actually, the organizing we've been doing in Yorkshire and the Humber, uh, which has involved, you know, universities working with local councils and communities and so on, um, you know, that's a form of fight back. And uh, basically, we got to support and work with local councils, local people, local organizations, third sector organizations, know them, know who they are, get involved. 
uh, because basically what I see across this country, which I did not see in the United States, is that the local councils and even now the combined authorities, there is a level of dedication and willingness to fight for people and fight for justice, to fight for sanctuary communities and so on, that I never saw in California or in the United States as a whole. It's here. And basically, this is a form, this is a base from which mm -hmm. the fighting has to start. So, so work with your local folk, and uh, let's go from there, and then win some elections nationally, too. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much. I think Gary and Aslam really comprehensive.